As we've just heard, the problems at the nuclear power plant in Fukushima, Japan, are growing more ominous. There was a third explosion. First, and there was fire, the earthquake, then the tsunami, and now the crisis in Japan is only getting more complicated. The intense Fukushima. radiation inside the reactor buildings means it's too dangerous for workers to enter. But a small team of American robots is getting ready to go in. On March 11th, 2011, the terrifying prospect of nuclear disaster became real when a magnitude 9.1 earthquake struck Japan. Next came a 15-meter tsunami, which overran the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant situated right up against the East Coast. Fuel cores melted down, hydrogen gas explosions blew out roofs and walls, and high levels of radioactive elements were released into the air and sea. It remains one of the worst nuclear disasters in history and will take decades to clean up. But this podcast is not about Fukushima. Well, it is, and it isn't. It's really about robots, not the rigid robots we're accustomed to, but soft robots. It's just that Fukushima presented an extreme and stark test where the limitations of robotic technology were on display. And it wasn't pretty, as you'll soon see. A robotics engineer at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory said this about the disaster. What would have been really great is if we could have sent robots in to do something as simple as turn a valve. What if there had been a different type of robot? A soft robot, as supple and pliant as skin and muscle, which moves fluidly and navigates naturally and easily through debris and confined spaces. They're resistant to the high radiation levels. Maybe one of them could have found the missing fuel core that melted its way through the containment vessel. Maybe another could have found and plugged leaks in one of the buildings where high levels of radionuclides were leaking into seawater. And maybe workers would have been exposed to less radiation during cleanup operations. It's all academic, of course, and it's a lot of what-ifs. But what other question has led to the attainment of so many big ideas? So on to the podcast about soft robots and a couple of grad students whose collaborative research is paving the way for these devices to withstand high radiation levels so they can work in dangerous areas of nuclear facilities or, on a really bad day, a disaster zone. From the College of Engineering at Oregon State University, this is Engineering Out Loud. So as you may know, when you say first-time robot, people generally think about rigid robot arms that place stuff from one place to another or that works in the uh, manufacturing plants of the automobiles. But soft robots are the ones that are made out of silicon or the materials that are as soft as silicon itself. Hello, my name is Osman Dan Yirmbeşoğlu. I'm from Turkey and I'm getting my robotics PhD at Oregon State University. The beauty of soft robot technology in there is it's adaptable. Imagine an elephant trunk. So it's just the trunk, right? It can lift heavy loads. It can be very, very gentle. It is very adaptable. It can squish around the small areas. It can bend on multiple angles. So basically, we are trying to mimic an elephant trunk. For example, to grasp delicate objects from one place to another, like picking a fruit from a tree or grabbing your burrito and transferring it from one line to another in a factory or grasping your egg and placing inside the carton. Also, we are building some robots, soft robots that can crawl. They are very slow, but they can walk in any environment, under snowy conditions, under fire conditions. Uh, A car can go over them and they keep moving. Soft robots are harmless against humans, and it is really hard to destroy them too. A big reason that they're so robust and mobile is that many designs are inspired by animal locomotion, or bio-inspired. They mimic, for example, the motions of snakes, fish, and the octopus. Doan is designing a meter-long soft arm inspired by that elephant's trunk he talked about. Soft robot technology has a ways to go before it catches up to its rigid cousins. But many of the capabilities of robots today seemed like pure science fiction a decade ago. They hold the promise to become safer alternatives to things like those big manufacturing robots isolated in cages for safety. Running into a soft robot would be akin to colliding with another person, but being smacked by a high-speed steel arm, well, that's killed people. 
Soft robots may help to restore limb movement in stroke victims, be used as prosthetics, or become a versatile tool in search and rescue operations. In the case of a collapsed building, if there's a small hole in there, if your rigid robot doesn't have the size that fit inside that hole, you cannot go in there. But you can push your soft robot, and since its shape is adaptable, it will shrink and go into that hole. Can these robots rescue someone? No, but these robots can be good for observatory purposes and identifying purposes because they can go into the many areas and investigate with the cameras and sensors and come back. It's going to take a little bit time for them to move because they're very slow, but they are very robust. The soft robots that Doan works with are made of a silicone rubber called polydimethyl siloxane. It's really squishy and kind of satisfying to play with good for stress relief. He makes them on a 3D printer that deposits, layer by layer, the entire robot. You just design the object in computer program, then send it to 3D printer, and 3D printer prints it for you. I'm, and I'm really happy to tell you guys that in Oregon State University, we developed this 3D printer that can make this one possible. So every time you're going to get the same result? Yes, every time we get the same consistency. Even there's an error, that error is consistent too. So it's really great to have a 3D printer make the job for you because you just need to design the thing and wait until your print is done. But a lump of static silicone isn't much of a robot. It's a lump. To actuate a soft robot, make it move, Doan pumps air or liquid through tubes that are connected to a network of small channels and pockets that run through the silicone body of the robot. Inside there is an empty cylindrical channel. When we push air inside it, what I mean is when we pressurize the channel, it bends towards one side, which is the thinner than the other side. By regulating the pressure and adjusting the thickness of the robot's walls, the robot can turn, crawl, raise up or down, roll, and even paint landscapes. Or maybe it's a self-portrait. You can decide. Just click the link in the show notes on our website to watch a soft, snake-like robot at Oregon State make art. There are also some other mind-bending robot videos on tap there. Now it's moving, but you still need to know what it's doing and where it's headed because the robot will not always be in sight. This is where things get even more extraordinary because running through the silicone body are veins of liquid metal sensors. Doan explains it better than I can. This liquid metal is a composition of gallium, indium, and tin so that we can keep a material liquid in the room temperature. We have the liquid metal inside the silicon channels. These channels are micro channels, very small. And in the change of motion, like in the bending motion, for example, those lines deform according to the bend angle. So that when a line deform, we are able to measure the resistance of the liquid metal material because it's acting like a resistor. So that when we actuate a motion, we can tell that, okay, we bend it 30 degree, but we want to bend it 50 degree. Let's give a little bit more pressure. For now, most soft robots are tethered to their control systems, which may limit their range. But eventually, as controllers get smaller, the robots will become self-contained. The supple elasticity of soft robots, their ability to compress and stretch and twist and bend, defines their essential nature adaptability. That quality will one day enable them to become inexpensive replacements for some rigid robots and accomplish tasks that rigid robots aren't well suited for. The nuclear industry has used rigid robots for years. They inspect pipes, check radiation levels, remove waste, and pressure wash contaminated surfaces, to name a few jobs. To protect the sensitive semiconductors in their circuitry, they're hardened or shielded against ionizing radiation which adds a lot of cost and weight. But all of them go about their business in known, structured environments like hallways, tunnels, and pipes, where moving around is pretty easy. Their tasks are routine and repetitive, and they're designed to complete specific jobs. The differences between nuclear energy and, let's say, like a Fukushima-type situation is these are very different situations. That's Tyler Oshiro, Doan's research partner and a master's student in radiation health physics in the School of Nuclear Science and Engineering. In the nuclear energy field, robots are required to do very repetitive tasks that humans can't. These are sometimes working alongside humans, 
sometimes independent of the humans. And the idea is to reduce dose to people by putting a robot in that task instead. But because this is an industry, there's an established way of doing things. And so the question of adaptability doesn't really play into that field as much as it does in, let's say, a disaster type or a waste scenario where the environment is unknown. What we deal with in a lot of nuclear environments is contamination. And so typically if these robots are contaminated, they can't leave the environment. With something like a soft robot that has detachable parts or the soft robot itself being completely 3D printed and easy to manufacture, uh, you'd have a robot that can then be disposed of as soon as it's contaminated after having completed its task and without a huge monetary hit to the operator. So soft robot body will enter the high radiation environment and the tubing lines that are coming out of the soft robot will create the distance from high radiation environment to low radiation environment. And we will be able to put our controller board, which will have the semiconductors, away from the high radiation. If you could send a soft robot instead to do those sort of tedious and dangerous tasks, you would be saving the industry a lot of money. They are relatively cheap and more disposable than traditional rigid robots. It's not a competition between rigid and soft robots, really. It doesn't need to outcompete rigid robots because it would have different applications that rigid robots either can't do or are not, cannot perform efficiently, or it wouldn't make sense for them to do. So for routine work in a controlled setting, rigid robots get the job done. But what about a scrambled, broken place? Let's return to Fukushima, a big mess and the epitome of an unstructured environment. Tokyo Electric Power, which owns Fukushima, didn't have a single robot for disaster response. Kind of surprising considering that Japan is home to a thriving robotics industry. Over a period of years, more than a dozen rigid robots went in. They all failed, sometimes within hours, either fried by the radiation or because they couldn't get around, over, or through the physical chaos. These robots are typically on wheels, sort of tank-inspired wheels with the rollers. Um, they can typically roll over different kinds of rubble. They can go up and down stairs. But in undefined environments, you really don't know what you're getting into. They have no way of adapting to an obstacle that's in their way if they were not designed to do so. So that rigid robot would then have to come back out. You'd have to make some adaptations either to that robot or send in a different robot. With a soft robot, you go in, you observe, you see that this valve is left open or that this needs to be sealed, and this soft robot that is more adaptable and um, is inherently equipped to perform more tasks can then just go and simply shut that valve off and come back out and saves you a whole lot of time, and it has completed that task much more efficiently and much more quickly. The idea, I think, especially in undefined environments, is that it can get into the environment faster and it can shut that off more quickly because it can adapt to the environment. Whatever its task, the robot must function while exposed to high radiation. So Doan and Tyler conducted a study where they subjected samples of the silicone rubber to levels of radiation that correspond to several processes in a nuclear plant. We exposed them to different doses of gamma radiation and saw how the increasing dose affected the mechanical properties. The two properties that I tested for primarily were elongation and compression, because that's what the soft robot's gonna have to be able to do. What we were looking for was red flags, basically. If this material could not hold up under radiation at all, then there would be no path forward for soft robots in radiation environments, because gamma is one of the big components of any radiation environment. Indeed, the radiation took its toll. And so you saw less of an ability for the robot to stretch and less of an ability to compress. So you required more force, basically, to make the robot do anything. And there was a certain point, I think above 400 kilogram, where the robot almost became a full solid at that point and was basically not operable. And at this point, I would, for the audience to understand, 400K is a great value. Yes, absolutely correct. So that means that soft robots will withstand ridiculously high radiation environments. They're planning the experimental design for their next study to test how the liquid metal sensors function in a radiation environment. In the same way that we looked at the silicone rubber, look for red flags. So if the liquid metal is exposed to, let's say, a mixed neutron gamma environment, 
if it's not going to become liquid anymore, because that would be a serious issue. So we're starting with things that we know we can test um, and then moving on to things that would be more important in the final product. Right before we finished, I brought up an article that quoted Doan, something that brought to mind an intriguing image of the future, when soft robots become as pervasive and indispensable as rigid robots are today. You said, it's easy to imagine making soft robots that are ready for operation that will just walk out of the printer. Yes. Currently, our team is working on multi-material printer, which will be able to 3D print the soft robot with embedded sensors on it. So when the print is done, what we need to do is to just install the tubes and we can make the robot walk out of the print bed. It's That's coming. Scary. It is soon. It's not scary. It is <laughs> lovely. In 2017, more than six years after the Fukushima disaster, a little aquatic robot nicknamed the Sunfish sent back the first images of the fuel core from reactor number three, which had melted through the bottom of its containment vessel and disappeared. But what if there had been a different type of robot? What if? This episode was produced and hosted by me, Steve Franzel, with additional audio editing by Brian Blythe. Thanks, Brian. You're welcome. Our intro music is The Ether Bunny by Eyes Closed Audio on SoundCloud and used with permission of a Creative Commons attribution license. Other music and effects in this episode were also used with appropriate licenses. You can find the links on our website, as well as some great videos. For more episodes, visit engineeringoutloud.oregonstate.edu or subscribe by searching Engineering Out Loud on your favorite podcast app. Bye now. And by the way, you've mentioned burritos four times, so <laughs> we'll be able to deliver burritos. I'm not sure. Maybe. I will try to make an uh, experiment with picking up a gr burrito and putting it somewhere else. Oh. When I'm done, I will send you the video. Oh, putting yes. it in your mouth would be kind of useful. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe. See, this would be a new, new avenue of research. There you go. <laughs> true, true. <laughs>